Uh, uh, we're on chapter 3, text 36. Um, Arjuna asks a question, and, and this happens uh, sometimes at the beginning of a chapter, sometimes halfway through the chapter, but it's a, in, in a lot of ways you can break up the Gita not based on um, the chapters. If you look in the Mahabharata, the Gita is not broken up into chapters. The chapters came later on. And so, in some ways, the Gita was arbitrarily broken up into chapters. Um, there's not a debate about it. If you look at all the commentaries over the last 1,500 years from the time of Shankar up until the present, um, you'll see that all the chapters break at the same points. Um, but another way to break up the Gita I mean, there's, you know, the, there's a commentatorial thing they do where they say the first six chapters are about this, karma, second about, six about bhakti, and the last six about jnana. And that's an interesting, there is a really nice break uh, at the end of chapter six, a nice break at the end of chapter 12, which does seem to indicate that you could break the Gita up into three parts, and that works also. Um, but another way to break the Gita up, which in some ways is more organic, is that you break up the Gita into... Krishna's answers and Arjuna's question then starts a new chapter. And so Arjuna doesn't jump in and ask questions that many times. So you know in the second chapter once Krishna gets running um, in the second chapter Arjuna really only interrupts one time to ask a question about the stita pragya muni, the person in, in, in wisdom. And so in the third chapter here, there's also only two sections. There's Arjuna's initial question, the first verse, where he says that Krishna's speaking equivocally, and Tade Kamvad, tell me just one thing. Um, and then there's, uh, there's this, this section here. And so if you were going to break the third chapter into two chapters, this would be the break. Now it's a short section, it's maybe half a dozen seven or eight verses, so it doesn't really warrant its own chapter, but it's a significant break. And as such, we don't need a whole lot of context to get into it. We can give a little, we can, we can give the chapter in a nutshell. The chapter starts out with Arjun saying that you're telling me about Buddha Yoga, but then you're trying to get me to do this Gora Karma, this horrible karma, but you're telling me about Buddha Yoga, which one do you want me to do? Do you want me to be a yogi and renounce, or do you want me to fight in the battle? And so he's misunderstood the teachings of the second chapter. And then Krishna responds, and he says, no, 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 you won't. Uh, everyone has to act just to maintain their body. There's no possibility of attaining a state of nice karma, beyond karma, simply by being a karma, by not doing anything. You have to do something. And so the best thing you can do is act in a regulated way. And in fact, you should do yagna. And then he brings up what yagna consists of. He goes back to the old Veda and he explains that yagna was spoken by Prajapati. It was given by Prajapati at the time the Vedas were composed. And this yagna is how you receive things, but then you give back. And there's this process of reciprocity. And then he explains that yagna comes from doing uh, you know, rains come from gra uh, grains come from rain. Rain comes from doing your duty. Doing your duty comes from the Vedas. The Vedas come from Krishna. And so, by connecting even materially with something you want to do to enjoy, by connecting to the process of yagna, you're purified. And then he posits that somebody could be beyond the stage of yoga. They they could be transcendental. They're atma rati. They can be transcendental. But then even then, to set an example for other people, like Maharaj Janak, then they'll still do their duty. And because, you know, what a great person does, common people follow. So even if you're beyond it, you should still do it to set an example for other people. He gives himself, Krishna gives himself as an example, that he has a responsibility to the world. As an all-good, all-powerful deity, to act in certain normative ways, set a good example for people in the world. And that he continues on, he says, so people should follow in his footsteps, and they should be detached themselves, they should be yukta, or yoga themselves, but they should engage other people 
in karma in a way which is purifying for them, which doesn't disrupt their minds. Krishna has a, has a heavy lesson that actually so much is being done by Prakriti and the gunas and that just foolish people think that they're in charge of everything. And if you understand this, how much people are just acting out of script that they're given by the modes of material nature, then you are transcendental. You're not bound by this world. You're in concert with Krishna. If you don't follow his advice, you'll suffer. And so, and then you, so that's what's happened thus far in the chapter. And then Arjuna now is shook because it's now been clarified for him that you are supposed to fight. You're supposed to do your duty. And, uh, um, and that, that, that you know, he should not be considering to renounce the world. But Arjuna doesn't want to fight. And so as he's wrestling with his lack of desire to fight and the necessity of him fighting, he then speaks this verse. And so Krishna, he says, Atakena prayukto yam papam charti purushaha. So, kena, by what? By what purusha? By what a person is charti papam, is moved to commit sin? By what is a person moved to commit sin? Prayukta, he's like, it's like enjoined for him. He's almost forced to do so. He's compelled to do so. What is it that forces one to do something wrong? What is this? Ayam prayukto kena. By what thing is one forced and moved charity papam to commit sin? Anichan api, even unwillingly. Balat iva niyojita. As if, as if compelled by force. By what is one impelled to sinful acts, even unwillingly, as if engaged by force? This is a, a, a traditional question. Again, um, a good way to break the Gita up is into Arjuna's questions and Krishna's subsequent answers. And if you look at the Upanishads as a whole, this body of literature, the Upanishads, there's a formula. And the formula is that a disciple asks a question and a guru gives an answer. That answer gives rise to further questions. And the entirety of the Upanishadic literature is comprised of questions and answers. That's, that's the formula for it. It's not a treatise. It's an answer to a question which then you know, espouses an entire philosophy. And the Gita is known as Gita Upanishad precisely because it follows this same formulaic structure of questions and answers. And this question is one of the major questions of the Vedic tradition and really of Southeast Asian religion in general and even more of philosophy and religion generally all over the world. Um, in the West, this becomes the problem of evil. Now, there is no concept of evil in Sanskrit. Words like pop, sin, or more, more generally, ag agyana, avidya, ignorance. Those are usually the, the worst source of all bad things in the world. Or tamas, darkness. But something like a fundamental malevolence, what, what would be equivalent to our conception of what evil consists of, uh, you know, a, dichotomized, dualistic system where there's fundamental good and there's fundamental evil and therefore there's a Christ-like figure and a, and a, and a devil-like figure. They don't have anything like that. Uh, the Sanskrit tradition, the Indic tradition, at least the Vedanta tradition that the Gita is a part of, is a monistic tradition where everything comes from one source. That one source is Brahman and now you have to account for how everything came from Brahman, an all-good, all-powerful deity. And so when you say fundamental evil came from an all-good, all-powerful deity, it doesn't really work. And Christianity runs into this problem. So they have to posit a devil who's almost as powerful as God. Um, but you, the, the worst you get is sort of ignorance of the truth is what gives rise to all bad things. 
the ignorance is the source of all quote unquote evil. And evil is really soft because evil can be transformed into good. But that's not how evil is conceived of in Western thought. So this question, why do I suffer? Why am I doing the wrong thing? Why can't I do the right thing? Is a standard question in Buddhism. It's a standard question in Hinduism. And it even winds up occurring in Western thought, what compels someone to leave God? What compels someone to sin? Why is it that we turn away from Christ? Why is it that we turn away from God? What is the immortal sin that we've been invested with? Where does it come from? And even saying you know, Adam and Eve messed up and the devil and, 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 and you're born with that. It's an attempt to answer this question. They might seem like different questions. They're actually not. They're different cultures with different worldviews asking the same question. If you believe in fundamental evil and fundamental good, then you would ask, where does fundamental evil come from? If you don't believe in fundamental evil, then you say, well, why do I do the wrong thing anyway? And so it might sound like a different question, but it's the same question. The difference is one tradition has a pure soul theology, which you're going to see in a minute, and the other tradition does not have a pure soul theology. They have a corrupted soul theology. So one is where does corruption originally come from? And that's where you have to go back to Adam and Eve and the devil. And the other one is where does this temporary corruption come from that's covered me in this lifetime? Did you guys follow that? And amazingly, in this section, you'll see in a minute, but, you know, Buddhism, the, the standard fourfold noble truth of Buddhism, the uh, um, uh, Chattvari Satyani, the Arya Chattvari Satyani, the fourfold noble truths of Buddhism, are idam dukkha, there is suffering, which is, anti which is um, uh, presupposed here, that there is sin. So there is idam dukkha. This is suffering. What is suffering? This world is suffering. And then idam dukkha samudaya. There is an origin of suffering, which is what Arjuna is asking right now. What is the origin of suffering? And according to the Buddha, the origin of suffering is trishna, or thirst, for material things. And then idam dukkha nirodha. There is an end of suffering. What is the end of suffering? When you extinguish trishna, or desire, or attachment. And then idam dukkha nirodha gamini pratipad, that there is a, pa a path that leads to the end of all suffering. And that is the ashtanga marg. That's the eightfold path of Buddhism. The, the eightfold path of right thought, right deed, right action, right determination, right vision, right wisdom. Um, and so on. Samyak drishti, samyak uh, drishti, samyak sankalpa, right vision, right uh, um, commitment, and then uh, samyak ka karmanta, right action, samyak ajiva, uh, proper livelihood, samyak vyavaya, uh, vyayava. Uh, right uh, uh, um, effort, and then samyak pragya and samyak uh, um, samadhi, right wisdom and right meditation, and there's one more, which I always forget, number eight, for some reason. Um, but that's what's, that's what's being, that's, that's Buddhism, and you'll see Krishna, amazingly, in a lot of ways, mirrors Buddhism. And you see this incredible congruence between Buddhist Buddhism and the Vedanta tradition because they grew up in the same place, although they have some strong differences. They also have an incredible degree of similarity because they grew up in the same place, in the same part of the world. And they, they, they spoke the same language. They borrowed from the same source text. And they, Buddha, in many ways, um, was a schismatic offshoot from Hinduism. And so, so much Hindu thought is reflected in early Buddhist teachings. Uh, which the, this, this fourfold, fourfold truth is, is an early Buddhist teaching. So anyway, this is, this is Arjun's question. Kena prayukta yam. Kena, by what 
is, is one compelled? By what thing I am? By what is this that compels one? Compels one what? Papam charati purusha, a person to do bad things. Anichan, even unwillingly. Prayukta, by force. Balat, like as if by force. An, an, anicha api, like even if you don't want to do the wrong thing. Do we all have experience of doing the wrong thing even though you don't want to do the wrong thing? Has it happened? It's happened in everyone's life, right? So it's a, it's a big question. Why do I sometimes do the wrong thing? And there's a, there's a number of, of answers. You know, sometimes it's easier. Little white lies, lies of omission. You do things to get ahead. You do things out of laziness. You do things because it's the easier path. It's the, you know, it's just, you just go along with the masses. There's so many answers. Those answers are all valid, but what we're looking for here is a fundamental answer. A singular answer. And all of those secondary answers are encapsulated within the single answer. Does that make sense? You know, it's like somebody might steal, somebody else might defraud you, somebody else might assault you, somebody else might commit murder. But they all have a thread in common, they're all crimes. So what is the, what's the one thing, the, the baseline that would encapsulate all of those secondary specific reasons why you might do the wrong thing? What's the big answer? And Krishna answers. Kama Esha, Kroda Esha, Rajaguna Samudbhavaha. So, Kama Esha, this calm. Kroda Esha, this Krodha. Rajaguna Samudbhavaha, coming from, born of, arising from, it's probably the best translation, arising from Rajaguna. So, calm and Krod. Calm and Krod. Kam means desire, almost exactly the same as the Buddhist concept of trishna, or thirst. We a lot of times translate kam as lust. The problem with translating kam as lust is that lust specifically refers to sex desire. Whereas kam does also refer to sex desire. Cupid, the god of love in Sanskrit, is called Kamdev. So the God of desire. So certainly calm does mean carnal desire, no doubt. But the term calm here in the philosophical literature is a more broad definition. And desire, I think, would be a cleaner translation than lust because it encapsulates a whole variety of material desires. Lust may be the epitome of it all, but you know, it's, there's, a, there's, you know, desire for so many things, material desires for ease, for enjoyment. What would be called, uh, uh, philosophically would be called hedonic utilitarianism, the desire to increase your pleasure and minimize your pain, to increase your pleasure. And there's a variety of ways, and they're not, if you think about the things you do to compromise your integrity, to increase your pleasure, sex is just one arena where such things happen. There's all sorts of other areas of your life. They may ultimately, you know, um, what do I want to say, um, culminate in sex. But there's certainly, there's certainly there's a lot of other stuff people are doing to enjoy the material world. So, kama and krod, krod means anger. Now, that would, this verse by itself would appear to weight calm and crowed equally. Because both of them are rajaguna samudbhava. So, samudbhava means they arise from. Ud means they come up from. They come into existence from. They're born from. They rise up from. Rajaguna. What? Asha calm. Asha crowed. This calm. This crowed. Now, certainly calm comes first, crowd comes second. So we could try to say which one comes first and 
in the verse itself, it says one comes first, one comes second. But they're just both stated. You know, it's like, like what's most important to you? You know, honesty and loyalty. You know, it's like you, you, you could make an argument those are both equally weighted. Maybe one word comes before the other word, but they're equally weighted. You follow? But if you go back, if you go back earlier in the Gita, um, it says, Jaya to vishayan pungsa sangate shupajayate. Sanjat sandayate kama kama kroda abhijayate. And so it says earlier in the Gita, in the last chapter, it says that born from attachment is Jaya to vishayan pungsa sangat. Born from sangha or attachment is calm. And born from calm is crowed. Crowed means anger. And this is easy enough to understand. You desire something, you don't get it, you're angry. You desire something, you get it, it gets taken away, you're angry. You desire something, you get it, it doesn't live up to your expectations, you're angry. So although an argument could be made that calm and crowed are equally weighted in this verse, by going back a chapter, we find that one actually comes from the other that crowed comes from calm, that anger comes from desire. And so the answer to this question is really one thing, desire which eventually gives rise to anger. Anger has a destructive quality to it. And so anger coming from desire is an important, it's important to say anger, lust and anger because those two things together are what destroys someone's quality of life. If you had to break it down to one thing, that one thing would be desire. Mahashano Mahapapma Vidhyenam Iha Vairinam. In this world, it's your enemy. It's your enemy. Know this to be your enemy in this world. Vidhi, know this. It's in the imperative. Vidhyenam Iha Vairinam. Know this to be your enemy in the world. Mahasha, no. This all-consuming, Mahapatma, greatly sinful thing. <laughs> know this to be your enemy. And certainly, just like for the Buddha, uh, this is your enemy. You get attached, you desire things in this world, and that desire compels you to compromise your integrity for short-term gain. It is lust only, Arjun, which is born of contact with the material mode of passion and later transformed into wrath, which is the all-devouring sinful enemy of this world. You see how Prabhupada expertly it's later transformed into wrath. So he goes back to the earlier chapter and includes that in his translation. Dumena avriyate vahnir yatada sho malena cha. just as fire is covered by smoke. Vahni means the carrier. It's a name for Agni, the god of fire, an old Vedic deity. And Vahni, or the carrier, is, for, is the name of Agni because when you made sacrificial offerings, then the flames and the smoke from those offerings would carry those offerings upwards to the gods. That was the idea. And so, um, Dumena avri, avriyate vahni, just as smoke covers fire. Yata adarsha malenatsha, just as dirt covers a mirror. Yata ulbena avrito garbos, just as the womb covers an embryo. 
tata tene tene dam avritam. So, so by this it is covered. So by this is covered. What is covered? Your intelligence, your ability to do the right thing, your ability to choose the path of Dharma, your ability to stick to the right path. It says by this it is covered. It doesn't tell you what's covered. It's assumed. It will tell you the next verse. But what are we, what are we talking about? Are you just saying what is it that I'm against my will forced to do the wrong thing? So what's covered? Your ability to do the right thing. Your knowledge, your clarity. And so three examples are given. Just as. Yatta and Tatta are co-relatives in Sanskrit. It says, just as this happens, so also this happens. Just as fire is covered by smoke, a mirror is covered by dust, and a womb is, uh, an embryo is covered by a womb, so also this is covered. So also this is covered. Um, Tene Tene idam avritam. So also this is covered in this way by that. Um, these three examples are usually linked to the three modes. And the word sattva means, well, let's leave sattva untranslated. It means existent real, good, true, beautiful. That's what sattva means. And then rajas literally means dust. And tamas literally means darkness. So these three terms, sattva, rajas, and tamas. If tamas means darkness and rajas means dusty, then what would sattva mean? You know, like they say, like, like it'll go like, you'll get like a, a logical problem. It'll be like one, three, five, Seven, and you have to guess the next two numbers. You guess nine and eleven because it seems like it's just going up odd numbers, right? Or one five twenty-five, and then like what's the next number? One twenty-five because it seems like you're going up by multiples of five, right? Could also be six twenty-five. That's not enough to know actually, because one five twenty-five. Oh no, it would be it would be times five. If it was 525 and then they asked you what was next, it could be five times itself or five squared, or it could be something times five. So 525 could either be 625, 25 times itself, or 125, 25 times five. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a small point. But if you got this list, then you would know 1, 5, 25, and then the next one would be 125. So if we know that Thomas means darkness, and then we know that rajas means dusty, then what does sattva mean? Light. Light, clear, exactly. Right? So in a philosophical context, the most likely translation of sattva would be light or clear. Not dusty, not dark. Clear. And so out of all the different words you could use for sattva, coming from sat in Sanskrit, which is a a very, very broad term that uses, it ultimately means existence, but it's used to mean a whole bunch of different things. It's um, so where you get the word sadhu from. Um, by looking at the other two words, we can, we can understand the best translation for it into English, which would be clear, clarity. So, usually these three things are linked up. So, fire covering smoke is one of the gunas. And then, dust covering a mirror is another guna. And then, the womb covering an embryo is the final one. So, match them up. Somebody, give me one. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Somebody else, give me one. Yeah. Fire covering smoke could be passion. Okay. Why? Uh, because passion is like fiery. 
Okay. Let's keep going. Come on. Why? What do you mean it's dark? In full darkness. Good. Okay. Next. Anybody else? Yes. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, I think everybody was wrong except for <laughs> except for um, except for Ross, and he's kind of half wrong. But I mean, I'm not sure. Not necessarily. Um, if fire is covered covered by smoke, can you still use a smoky fire? Yes. It still perform its function. Yes. Can you still see the flames? Yes. Okay. That's sattva. There's some contamination, but not enough to stop it from doing its duty. The whole idea of like fire is like fiery. That, you know, that doesn't work. Um, fire is, 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 is pava, it's purifying. It's considered to be a good thing. So, not always. Not always. Krishna's going to use it in a negative sense in just a minute. Or if we talk about forest fires, a bad sense. Um, but fire is is in sattva. Usually the commentators do it like this. And then dust covering a mirror renders the mirror unusable. So that rajas means dusty, and the mirror is covered by dust and dirt, so obviously that's rajas. Dirt. And so the thing being covered is pure. So the fact that the mirror is pure in its ultimate stage so is fire, so is the embryo. So everything's pure in its ultimate state. The question is the degree of contamination. Uh, fire being covered by smoke doesn't render it unusable. Dust covering a mirror does render it unusable. That's rajas. And then the covering is complete when a baby's covered by the womb. You can't even see, you can tell there's something there. You know there's a baby in there, but you can't see anything. You can't even see the form. You can see the form of the mirror. You can see the fire itself, but you can't even see the baby. You follow? But you could actually also flip it and say the baby is completely covered and in total darkness. So that also works as well. I was, from the external person's point of view, using the thing, because that's how the other two were done. So it would be strange to flip it, that the, you know, the mirror is covered, like as if the mirror has some, is being covered, right? Or the fire is being covered, as if the fire has some in existence. Usually we think of these things in relation to ourselves, but with the third example, provided you realize you're flipping it from the person who's using the thing to the thing which is being used, it also works because the, the, the baby is in darkness. So I never thought of it like that, but it actually works. And it's, it's a reasonable explanation. In some ways, it's even better than mine. But mine has the elegance of the 135 where I'm using the same thing. I'm trying to use fire. I can use a fire. I'm trying to use the mirror. I, can, I can't use the mirror. I'm trying to like see the baby. I know it's there, but I can't see anything. So the baby covered by the, uh, the womb is, is tamas. It's almost complete. And that's, you know, usually when you get these multiple examples, you know, the commentators will rush to say, okay, this one matches up with this. They'll find some formula, and they'll put the examples into a formula so you can appreciate some of the nuances between them. It's a very common thing that's done. I'm really losing my light here. Um, I mean, I'll survive. As fire is covered by smoke, as a mirror is covered by dust, or as an embryo is covered by the womb, the living entity is similarly covered by different degrees of this lust. You see where Prabhupada puts in that, the living entity, as it is. It's assumed that you understand what's being spoken of here. It could also contextually be Arjuna's, you know, the, the living entity's ability to do the right thing in its pure state is covered. Avrittam jnanam etena jnanina nitya vairina. By this, the knower's knowledge is covered by his eternal enemy. Nitya vairina means by his eternal enemy. Jnanina, the knower's jnanam knowledge. Avrittam is covered. Etena in this way. 
So now the knower. The knower is us. We are the knower who should have proper knowledge. Interestingly, a lot of times we talk about knowledge as being something extrinsic to ourselves that we acquire. If you think about it, that's how we think about knowledge. Knowledge is a thing that you can acquire. It's extrinsic to yourself. It's external to yourself. You then imbibe it and you make it yours. That's not what the verse says. The verse explains that naturally you have knowledge. And that that knowledge of the self. I mean, this will be made more clear in other sections. Sukha matmani vindati, jnana matmani vindati, you know, uh, you know, you'll find happiness within yourself, you'll find truth within yourself, you'll find knowledge within yourself. These kind of terms are used in the Gita. But you see it at least being hinted at here. That you naturally have knowledge. That's the natural state. That's the clear state. That's the pure state. And then that becomes covered by ignorance. Which is a fascinating question. How does the living entities knowledge become covered. Irrespective of whether you believe that evil comes or whether you believe that your knowledge is, is covered, either one is a fundamental question about our existence that has to be answered to present you know, a, a, a clean philosophy. So you know, evil is it's God's fault. It's, the, well, it's not God's fault. It's the devil's fault. It's Adam and Eve's fault. But if your parents commit a crime and went to jail, would it make sense for their great, 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 great grandchildren to be born in prison? No. Would that be fair? No, it wouldn't be fair. It used to be in the old world, you were allowed to send your children to prison to suffer for you. It used to be your children would be born into bondage. They would be born as indentured servants or slaves even. That was the old world situation. You, you, when you died, your family inherited your debt. You can't pass on your debt to your children. You can pass on your wealth to your children, and then they have to also take on your debt when they take on your wealth. But you can't just pass on debt to your children. They can deny the inheritance, and they're free. You can't send a child to prison for the crimes of his parents. We figured this stuff out, you know, centuries ago. I mean, we're going back to the Dark Ages at this point, when you could punish a child for the crimes of their parents. Um... And so the idea that Adam and Eve or the devil created evil and then were born into a mortal sin ultimately becomes a critique of God. Because would an all-powerful God have to make us be born into a sinful situation? No. Would an all-good God want us to be unnecessarily? Because again, if he's all-powerful, we wouldn't have to be born into a sinful situation. But um, would an all-good God want us to be born into a sinful situation? No. So an all-good God would not want us to be born with a big chip on our shoulder. An all-powerful God could make it so we were born with a clean slate. And so if you say that it's Adam and Eve's fault, they messed up, and now everybody subsequently suffers, you end up with this not all-good or not all-powerful God who can't actually give you a clean slate. Now, we don't believe you're born in this world with a clean slate. We believe in karma. But that karma is ultimately traceable back to you. It is not some external person's fault. It was your wrong decisions that you're born with. And so we still account for suffering and people being born in different situations, but we do it without blaming somebody outside of yourself, which is valuable because if it's somebody outside of yourself, God could have created the world where you weren't punished by people outside of yourself unfairly. Could an all-powerful God have created a world where you have significant free will and you don't have the potential of making mistakes? The answer is no. Could an all-powerful God create a world where you had significant free will, but you were born without the potential of having made mistakes? No. Do you understand? If you have free will, that means it's on you. That means God's giving up absolute control over what you do, and you're being allowed to write your own adventure. Did you guys follow this? This is really basic stuff. I don't know why you're looking at me like you're high on crack or you're lobotomized or something like this. It's like pretty simple stuff. I don't want to waste my time doing the preschool version of this. If you have free will, it means you can make mistakes. 
That means an all-powerful God who gave you free will is no longer all-powerful with regard to things that are within the purview of your free will. You actually have free will. The all-powerful God that doesn't have absolute deterministic power because you have free will, which means you're allowed to make mistakes. Now, an all-powerful God can still claim he's all-powerful because he gave you that free will in the first place, So, but it's nonetheless, functionally, he's no longer driving everything. You're a driver in your own right. Did you follow that? Okay. Wouldn't all good God give you free will? Yes. So an all good, all powerful deity would give you free will, which would mean you're responsible for some of the things you do, and that's a way how, how you get God out of the, the fault of being born with bad things. If you don't go back more than one lifetime, and you don't find a way to hang out on yourself, either somebody else gets to do it to you, and that's not an all good, all powerful God, because why would they let somebody else just torture you? Or if it's God himself who arranged it with the devil and Adam and Eve way back when, then he's even more of a jerk. This one, he's kind of impotent because you guys have power over him. And this one, he's actually not all good anymore. But either one of which, he's failing in some major capacity. The one where you blame yourself, but if you don't believe in fundamental evil, what do you believe in? Well, you believe in the ability to turn away from God, to become Krishna, but here we'll turn away from God. And then that becomes the beginning of our ignorance. You could even argue that, well, how could a fully knowledgeable living entity ever turn away from God? And then the answer would be, well, then an all good God would create you with enough ignorance that you had the free will to choose. Because maybe if you saw everything, you wouldn't be able to make the wrong choice. So he'd have to be, he'd have to be remote enough from you and give you enough independence and enough ignorance to allow you to f truly make your own choice without determining it for you. And if you were born, if you were, were created with absolute knowledge, that might not be possible. So that maybe there would be a little tiny bit of ignorance, which is essentially given to the soul by an all-good, all-powerful deity to allow for that free will to be true. But then you're left with a fundamentally pure soul who's able to make decisions and thereby begin the process of covering themselves. And that's a pure soul theology. No need to explain evil. But you do have the tricky thing of explaining where ignorance came from. Anyway, we could have a much larger conversation on this point, but I just want to... So, but you see a little bit of that pure soul theology where the soul is conceived of as being covered by ignorance as opposed to ignorance being its natural state. In a corrupt soul theology, like Christianity, the soul is fundamentally ignorant, and by the vicarious atonement of Christ, they become purified. Here, you're fundamentally in knowledge, and you're covered by ignorance. And this could be, you know, in this world, temporarily, it could also be fundamentally in every lifetime. It could be right now, like what makes you do something bad, like right now, you, were, you had knowledge, but that lust took away your knowledge and you made a stupid mistake. That's what people do. They, they make bad decisions when they're too attached to something. But it could also be a more fundamental question. What got me in this world in the first place? You follow? And so I want to give you an answer for both. Thus the wise living in these pure consciousness becomes covered by his eternal enemy in the form of lust, which is never satisfied and which burns like fire. Oh, sorry. Kama rupena, in the form of lust. Dusprena analena cha, which is insatiable and which burns like fire. There's fire being used in a negative sense. Dusprena analena cha. It's never satisfied and it burns like fire. Isn't desire like that? It's just more is never enough. It's just like, like no one knows what enough is. No one knows when is enough. No one knows when to stop. People just keep going. They keep doubling down. They win, they double down. They triple down, they quadruple down until they lose. That's why casinos make money. You get this like thirst. Even you do good, you keep moving. You do bad, you keep moving. It's like, like no matter what happens, this desire. You, if you lose, you think, okay, I'll win next time. Let me double down. If you win, you think, oh, hey, I'm winning. Let me double down. And you just keep playing until you're done. You see where Prabhupada interprets the verse not in a temporary sense, what makes you make a bad decision right now. But he, answer, he sees it more as a fundamental answer to the eternal question. And that's supported by saying, uh, that it's uh, uh, 
uh, sorry, nit nitya vairina, uh, by your eternal enemy, indicating that it's like a, a fundamental primordial problem as opposed to a temporary, in this moment, why did I make a bad decision last week? It's a larger question. Indriyanam, Indriyam Mano Budhir, Asyadishtanam Uchate, Etai Vimohati Esha, Gyanam Avritya Dehinam. The knowledge of the embodied soul is covered, is bewildered. The knowledge of the embodied soul is covered. And then that soul becomes bewildered. What becomes bewildered? His senses, his mind, and his intelligence. These are the sitting places of this desire by which one becomes bewildered and their knowledge becomes covered. So uh, we have a list here. Indriyas, your senses. Mano, your mind. Buddhi, your discrimination. Asya, th these things of you Adishtanam, these are the sitting places. This is where the lust resides. This is where the desire resides. Etai vimohati esha. And these are what bewilders you. These are what are bewildered by this lust. So lust gets into your senses and you feel physically disturbed. Like let's say sex desire. It's physically disturbing. You're, you actually feel it in your body. But then your mind can also become disturbed. You start to meditate on it. Then your discrimination becomes disturbed. You start to think about making plans how you're going to satisfy your lust. So the lust can reside in three places. The easiest place to deal with lust is the senses. You take a cold shower, go for a run, take some deep breaths, do a little pranayam, do some bandhas. If it gets in your mind and starts irking you in your mind, that's a lot more formidable. It's, it's infiltrated further, like an enemy that infiltrates different places in a fort. That's another layer if your mind is now disturbed. Then, if, then by the time you're making plans to satisfy your lust, it's almost, you're almost unsavable. You're almost unsavable. It's still possible to do an intervention. It's still possible. But it gets a lot harder. It's a lot more difficult. So, Indriyam Mano Budhir Asya Adishtanam Uchate Etai Vimohati Esha. The senses, mind, and intelligence of the living entity are the places where this lust bewilders you, by which this lust becomes bewildered. Jnanam avritadehinam, and the embodied living being's knowledge becomes covered. Tazmat, uh, the senses of mind intelligence are the sitting places of this lust. Through them, lust covers the real knowledge of the living entity and bewilders him. Therefore, in the very beginning, curb the great, the great, this great symbol of sin, lust, by regulating the senses and slay this destroyer of knowledge and self-realization. Tazmatvam indriyani adao. Therefore, you, starting with the senses, niyamya, control yourself, Bhartashava. Patmanam prajahi slay this great source of sin. Hienam slay this great source of sin. Kill this great source of sin. Jnana vijnana nashnam, which is the destroyer of jnana and vijnana, knowledge and wisdom. Indriyani 
Paran Yahur. The senses are said to be great. The senses are said to be great compared to your body. It's not stated here, but it's, it's implied. The senses are great, but great compared to what? To your body. Like if, you're, if your eyes become attracted to something, right? Or if your ear becomes attracted, right? They, like, they are able to pull your body in a direction. So the senses are powerful. Indriyabhyaparamana. But the mind is more powerful than the senses. The mind is greater than the senses. The senses are great, but, but the mind is greater still. Is that true? Imagine if you really wanted to, like, you saw something very attractive, like a, a beautiful person, you wanted to look at them. But then you remembered you were doing something really important. You were working on something, like, let's say you were doing surgery, or you were, you know, fixing something that needed to be fixed. It was an emergency. Could you stay focused on your work and ignore what's going on out there? Certainly you can. That's the proof that your mind is superior to your senses. The senses can be controlled by the mind. Manasas tu parabud here. But the discrimination is even more powerful than the mind. The mind is your thoughts. And then buddhi is your ability to control your thoughts. So that's certainly the most powerful. I had to study for my test, can't do anything else. Certainly you have the ability to pull your mind away. If you're daydreaming, you're sitting in a classroom, you're daydreaming, you're somewhere else. But your intelligence can pull your mind back and control your mind and force you to pay attention to what you're doing and focus on the task at hand. That's why intelligence in many ways is focus. Everyone has the capacity for focus. When you focus, you're intelligent. Focus gives very, very high level of intelligence even to stupid people. If you can learn how to focus, you increase your intelligence dramatically. Yabudhe paratastusa. But he is even higher than the intelligence. Who is the he here? He or she? The soul. The soul. Yeah. The soul. So this is a standard Sankhya hierarchy created where you define the world in you know, our world, in terms of like your body, your senses, your mind. It goes all the way back to the Kata Upanishad and the analogy of the horse is given. The first definition of yoga given in the Kata Upanishad is uh, uh, Yoga Indriya Dharanam Tada Tada Apramata Bhavata Yoga Prabhav Apyayao. That yoga requires some acquisition, some elimination. And now be careful. Yoga is indriya dharanam. Yoga is controlling the senses. And then right after that verse, tam yoga indriya dharanam tata apramata bhavati yoga pravav apyayao. That yoga is the controlling of the senses. And then you must be careful because the senses are wild. You must be sober and you have to acquire something and eliminate something. And that verse, which is the first definition of yoga in the Vedic literature, in a, you know, a kind of spiritual philosophical sense, is then followed by the analogy of the horses. And the soul is the passenger, and the driver is the intelligence, and the reins of the mind, and the horses of the senses, and the chariot is the body. And so that, that hierarchy is there from going all the way back to the Upanishads. And you find that same hierarchy here. Sankhya not only tells you what's in the world, but it also creates a hierarchy and a structure for the world. And so you see that, and this is valuable because you know where the, where the desire can influence. You know which ones are worse than the others. You know which you should steal is like, well, you're not going give, to give away. What's going to keep you strong? You know the different degrees in which... And so Krishna's giving like a really systematic teaching of the basic features of desire and how it's a formidable opponent and how you can steel yourself against it. And in this context, 
this lust, this desire that Krishna's having to cure Arjuna of, what is this desire that, that Krishna's curing Arjuna of? You guys remember? This bad, lusty desire that Krishna's curing Arjuna of, what is it? Yeah? That's it. So we'll interpret it as sex desire, greed, or whatever it is we're struggling with. But in this context, it was the desire not to fight. And so even those, the desire not to do your duty, the desire to avoid doing what you should be doing with your life, is what's being spoken of here. Literally. That's, what the, that's the context of the verses. It has a much broader implication because it's answering one of the big questions of life that you find in Buddhism, you find in Christianity, you find in any philosophical tradition. It has to answer, like, what is it that knocks people off the path? Why do we have such a hard time in this world? Why do we suffer so much? And so whether you're a Stoic or you're an American existentialist or you're a Christian or you're a Buddhist or you're one of us, these are fundamental questions that need to be answered. And Krishna's answer, like, like many of the answers in the Vedanta tradition, it's very systematic, it's very structured, it's replete with examples, it's meant to be functional, it's meant to be understood by people who are intelligent, who are focused, who have almost a collegiate level of, of desire to understand and master a topic. Where does it sit? How do I extirpate it? What do I need to worry about? How can I analyze myself? What are different degrees that can affect me? What are my strongholds? The working senses appear to dull matter. Mind is higher than the senses. Intelligence is still higher than the mind. And the soul is even higher than the intelligence. Evam budhe param budva. This kill your enemy, Jahi Shatrum, Jahi Shatrum, kill your enemy, Kama Rupa that's in the form of lust, durasadam, which is difficult to approach. Like a formidable enemy is difficult to approach. So it's difficult to approach that. It's like difficult to kill it. It's like a formidable enemy. It's like well protected. You have to protect yourself and your enemy is also well protected and you have to kill that enemy which means you have to be expert. Jahi shatrum kama rupena durasadam. Kill your enemy in the form of lust which is very difficult to approach. Some stubyatmanatmana. Steady yourself by the self. Steady the self by the self. Evam budhe param budva. Knowing that you are beyond the intelligence. Having known budva, having known that you are param budhe, having known that you exist even beyond the intelligence, steady yourself by the self, which is beyond even the intelligence. It says, he is beyond the intelligence. Who is that he? The Atma, which is mentioned in the next verse. And then, some stub yatman atmanam. Steady yourself by the self. Jahi shatrum. Kill your enemy. Kama rupa in the form of lust. Durasan, even though it's difficult to approach. By this wisdom, by this knowledge, which then kind of restores you and empowers you to now be a contender yourself in this great fight. And so it's just, you know, it's, it's interesting how you know, when you look at Buddhism and you compare it to these verses, there's just a lot of similarities. There's a lot of similarities. Steady yourself, steady your intelligence, steady your wisdom, steady your knowledge, and those things are going to help you. And this, there's a suffering, it's caused by desire. And like these, like the, the basic structure of the verses is the same because this is, it's a powerful cross-cultural idea. So Arjuna has a question, why is that I can't always do the right thing? And Krishna has an answer, because you're attached. And it messes you up. And it jams you up. And it can cover you the way a, a mirror is covered by dust, 
the way a fire is covered by smoke, the way 